everybody. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, I'm Maria. I also work in the V8 team as a software engineer, and I'm going to talk about parsing JavaScript. Uh, so this talk is going to be about V8, the engine behind Google Chrome, and how we parse JavaScript. So I figured if I'm going to give a parser talk, I should probably tell you what parsing is, just to get everybody on the same page, and then why you should care about it. Uh, then I'm going to talk about how V8 parses JavaScript, and what you, as a web developer, can do to help us to parse better. So what is parsing? So for those who didn't see the previous talk, the parser gets the JavaScript source code and constructs data structures called AST and scopes based on it. Uh, I'll tell you in a minute what those are. And then the bytecode generator walks those data structures and generates bytecode. The bytecode is then executed by the interpreter. And the optimizing compiler also gets the bytecode and constructs machine's code based on it. And then the machine code is executed directly. So let's look at some simple source code and what the parser does with it. So the parser constructs an AST, an abstract syntax tree, that describes the structure of the source code. For the function, there is a function literal. And then there is a variable declaration and an assignment. And every time we see a variable name, we create a variable proxy object for it. We don't yet know what variable that is. That just represents a reference to a variable. And the zero is a literal. Then there is an if statement. It has a condition, a then part, and an else part, which is empty here. And the then part contains more code. There is another variable declaration and an assignment. And again, we create variable proxy objects to represent the name of the variable. And then there is a return statement, again, with a variable proxy. So this is the AST that the parser generates based on the code. In addition to the AST, the parser also generates scopes where the, function, where the variables are declared. So now, for the function, there is one declaration scope. And for the if statement body, there is another scope. And the declaration scope contains the variable A, and the if statement body contains the variable B. And the scopes also contain the variable references, the variable proxies that occur in the code which, which belongs to that scope. And then we do scope analysis. This means we connect the variable proxies to the declared variables. So in this phase, we figure out that all references to A actually mean the variable declared in the function, and all references to B uh, mean a different variable. And to do this, it's not enough to just look at the current scope where we're in. For example, with the return statement, there is return A, but A is not declared in that scope. Instead, what we need to do is that we walk up the scope chain to find where the variable is declared, and now we find it in the parent scope, in the declaration scope. OK, so this is quite a lot of detail on one slide. And in reality, it's even more interconnected. I just couldn't draw all the arrows on the slides. Uh, this was really exhausting to make. Maybe it's also super exhausting to look at. But just look at this for a second. <laughs> so why should you care about parsing? Here's a diagram of where real-world web pages spend their time in V8. So parsing is the orange blob on the left. And turns out the web pages spend around 20, uh, 15 to 20% of their V8 time in parsing. So parsing is definitely on the critical path for a web page startup. According to Google's uh, production web app study, a typical single page web app loads around 0.4 megabytes of JavaScript and spends around 370 milliseconds parsing it on mobile. Uh, so that's quite a lot of time if you think about it. So this means that our parsing speed is roughly one megabyte per second on mobile. So how does V8 parse JavaScript? Uh, I'm going to talk about our two parsing modes, eager and lazy, and then a bit about why parsing is hard and why benchmarking it is hard. So we actually don't have one parser. We have two parsers. They are called parser and pre-parser um, for historical reasons. Parser is the full eager one. It's used for parsing functions we want to compile right now. It builds the AST. It builds the scopes that I showed before. And it finds all syntax errors in the code. 
Preparser, on the other hand, is the fast, lazy one. Um, it's just for you, used for skipping functions we don't want to compile, at least not right now. So it basically just finds where the function ends so that we can carry on. It doesn't build an AST. It, it builds scopes, but it doesn't put variable references or variable declarations in the scopes. It's approximately twice as fast as parser, and it only finds a restricted set of errors. So it doesn't actually comply with the ECMAScript spec, but we are somehow getting away with it. So here's an example of how we use these two parsers to parse your JavaScript code. So all top-level code is eager. We use the actual parser to parse it. Uh, when we see an iffy, an immediately invoked function expression, or something we recognize as an iffy, we eager parse that. So in this example, there is a parent before the function. We figure out that this is probably because you want to call the function right after. So we should eager parse that. And in this case, the guess is correct and there actually is a call to this function. So this is eager parsed. Other top-level functions, which are not ifs, are uh, lazy parsed. So we use the pre-parser for parsing that function body. And later on, at some point in time, you might want to call this function. So at that point, when you call the function, the function is then eager parsed and compiled and executed. There are some other heuristics. If there is an exclamation mark before the function, that turns the function eager. And if that is then followed by comma and another function, then this is also eager. And then you can have another comma and more functions. These are all eager. Um, here are some trickier lazy versus eager cases. So the problem is that we need to make the decision on which parser to use before we see the function body or anything that follows the function body. So basically, we need to see it when we see the function token. So in the first example, we assign a function to a variable. And this function is lazy. There is no parent before it. This is fine. We just use the pre-parser and lazy parse this function. The second example looks just like the first one, except we call this function and assign the return value of that call to F2. But we cannot know it when we need to make the decision on whether to parse or pre-parse, or whether to eager parse or lazy parse this function. So we end up making the exact same uh, um, decision in both cases. So in the second line, we also uh, lazy parse this. And when this line is executed, uh, we need to eager parse it right after and compile it. But this is, it was kind of the wrong decision, but we just couldn't know based on like, the code that we have seen so far. So these lazy versus eager rules are not specified in the spec. Each engine is free to implement them as they see fit, or they don't need to implement lazy parsing at all if they don't like to. So V8 just tries to guess, based on the syntax, which functions are probably called, and then eager parse those functions, and lazy parse the rest. So why is this relevant for you? So it turns out we need lazy parsing because web pages ship a lot of code they don't execute, at least not on, not on startup. So we want to use as little um, work for doing, for, do as little work for, for processing that code that is not needed. It's also important that we pick the right one to use. If we eager parse something that is not needed, we're just wasting time. It's unnecessary. On the other hand, if we lazy parse something that is needed, then we pay the cost of pre-parse and right after the cost of parse. And the pre-parse cost is, is half the parse cost, and then the actual parse cost. So that's like one and a half times the parse cost that we need to pay. Of course, the problem is knowing what code is executing on startup. You can also force eager parsing by wrapping functions that are critical for startup in parents. So that will force the eager parsing and eager compilation of those functions. There is a library called optimize.js that does this. So it has some rules on like what functions should, should have parents around them, and then that results in speed ups with most of the browsers. But really, we should just parse and compile the right functions, like not depending on whether parents are in funny places in your code. We should also minimize the cost for cases where we get the guess wrong. So this is an area that we are actively working on in the V8 team. Lazy parsing inner functions is more complicated than lazy parsing top-level code. And to understand why, 
we need to look at context allocation. So here is some example code. There is a function order, which is an ify. There is a parent before the function and a call right after. So we eager parse that. So that function has a variable, local variable, called a. And then it has an inner function that returns this local variable. And then this function outer returns a reference to the inner function. So now we call this function and assign the return value to f. So now f will be a reference to inner. And then we call f, and we print out the return value. So this will print out 20, as you might expect. But where is the 20 coming from? So normally, when you call a function, its local variables are put on the stack. But here, when we are calling f, we are not inside a call to outer. So it definitely cannot be on the stack. So where is it? The, fun uh, the answer is it's in the function context. So a function context is an object which the inner function also refers to and keeps it alive. So now we have a reference to the inner function because f is a reference to it. So that's how the function context is then kept alive. And when f accesses, when inner accesses the variable a, it reads it from the function context. Um, so if we want to lazy parse inner functions, if we want to lazy parse inner, in this case, we need to know which variables they refer to so that we can put those variables in the function context and not put other variables there. We don't want to put all variables to the function context because accessing them from there is just way slower than accessing them from the stack. So normally, lazy parsing doesn't care about variable names, but now we need to. So we need something like lazy parsing with names, and the speed for doing that is somewhere between parser and preparser. So this means that lazy parsing inner functions will always be heavier than lazy parsing top-level functions, just because of these semantics. Um, modern JavaScript is heavily nested. Maybe 15 years ago, you may, might have had like a lot of top-level functions. You don't have that anymore. Everything is wrapped in iffy functions. Everything's a module now. So this is a price you have to pay for nesting functions like that. In some situations, V8 also has to reparse code that it has already lazy parsed. So in this example, there is a lazy outer function. There is no parent before the function, so we lazy parse it. And we, of course, lazy parse everything inside the function, too. And then when we call this lazy outer function, we need to do something for inner. And how it currently works is that we need to pre-parse or lazy parse inner again, even though we have lazy parsed it already once. And it gets even worse if you nest more. So now, in the first run, when we go through the code, we lazy parse lazy outer and lazy parse everything inside it. So we lazy parse inner and lazy parse inner too. At some point, you call lazy outer. So at that point, we eager parse lazy outer because that's the code you want to execute. And then we lazy parse inner and inner too. Then again, if you call inner, we eager parse inner because that's the code you want to call now. And then we need to lazy parse inner two for the third time. So obviously, this is quite bad. This is not how it should work. And this is something that I'm personally working on. Instead of lazy parsing, we should just skip those functions if we have already lazy parsed them once. So why is parsing hard? The JavaScript grammar is not ambiguous as such, but it contains some constructs where we don't know upfront what we are parsing. One example is arrow function parameter lists and comma expressions. So they look just the same. If you just see opening parent ABC, you don't really know what that is. Maybe it's an arrow function parameter list, or maybe it's just a comma expression. It's also possible that it's a valid comma expression, but not a valid arrow function parameter list. If you see A12, that's a valid comma expression, but A12 is not a valid arrow function parameter list. But we don't really know like, whether this is an error or not before we see whether there is an arrow following, following the expression. We, we just cannot know, when, for example, when we see the 1. The other way around is also possible. So a dot 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 b is perfectly OK arrow function parameter list. It's just arrow function with the rest param. But a dot 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 b is not an OK comma expression. And this is also something we just cannot know when we are parsing. We don't know whether the user intends to use it as an arrow function parameter list. 
So how the V8 parser solves this is that it never rewinds. Instead, when it's parsing an unknown construct, it's parsing a very permissive grammar that allows both kind of constructs. And then it records whether it has seen something that makes it a valid arrow invalid arrow function parameter list or an invalid comma expression. And then when we see the uh, closing pattern, we can check if there's an arrow. And if there is an arrow, we check what's the thing that we just parsed a valid arrow function parameter list. So we just check the information we recorded when parsing that, but we don't jump back and reparse it or anything like that. So the parser also has very high feature complexity, and new language features are added to it all the time. So here is a typical parser bug that I found some time ago. The bug is eager parsing fails with that code. OK, but like, what is this even? So it's, there is a variable g. And we assign to g an arrow function. The arrow function has two parameters. There is the destructuring x, and then there is g. And the parameter g has a default value. And the default value is, again, an arrow function with an empty parameter list and a body. And the body is eval x. So now, if I force eager parsing, if I disable lazy parsing, then this fails. So we call the function g without providing a value for g. So the default value kicks in. And then this eval is just confused and says, I have no idea what you're talking about. What is this x? Even though it should resolve to the parameter x. So the features involved in this bug are lazy versus eager, a destructuring. There is the destructuring x. Turns out this is not relevant. So this bug is also reproducible without the destructuring. There are default parameters. There are arrow functions. And now an arrow function is used as a default parameter to another arrow function. And then there is eval. And it's important that the eval is in the body of an arrow function, which is a default parameter. So this is just to give you an idea of the sort of complexity that we are dealing with in our everyday work. Benchmarking parsing is also non-trivial. Here I have some mock benchmarks. Benchmark 1 is not even a parsing benchmark. It's some random benchmark. It has one big function with lots of code. And the function looks just like a lazy function. There is no parent before it. It's not an iffy. And then the actual benchmark starts the timer, calls this function, and measures how long it took. But now, if we implement lazy parsing the way I described, we need to parse the function when the timer is running. And this is really bad for the benchmark. For the benchmark, it would be way better to just do as much work up front as we can and like parse and compile everything when the timer is not running yet. So if, even though we need lazy parsing for the web, it really makes the benchmark score here worse. It's a difficult trade-off. And there is another benchmark, benchmark 2, that tries to be a parsing benchmark. So what they typically do is we start a timer, we eval a lot of code, and then we measure how long it took. So OK, this is fair. Like This definitely exercises parsing when the timer is running. But this is totally not how your browser loads JavaScript. When you load JavaScript from a file, from a resource, a wholly different code path kicks in, as in here. And for example, there are some improvements we do for the standard code path, for the um, normal code path. For example, we download and parse scripts in parallel. And these kind of improvements don't benefit this kind of benchmark at all, because eval is just not using the same code path. So what can you do uh, to help us parse better? So none of the stuff I talk about can be sort of black and white, like do this or like absolutely don't do that. I can only tell you like, how things look from the parser point of view, and then you can sort of figure out what's the good trade-off for you and your use case. Um, so a lot of the stuff you can find in a blog post called JavaScript Startup Performance. The first thing is ship less JavaScript, please, so that we don't need to parse so much. <laughs> um, <laughs> You can also use the code coverage 
functionality in dev tools to see what parts of your code are not needed or not needed on startup. So maybe it's possible to lazy load some of that code. You can also measure the parse cost of your code and the dependencies with Chrome tracing and the V8 runtime stats in it. So here you can see the concrete number of milliseconds that V8 spends parsing your code. V8 also has this feature called code caching, where we cache the bytecode of frequently used scripts. So whenever you load the same script frequently, V8 detects that and puts the bytecode of that script into a cache. And the next time you load the script, we don't need to parse it. We don't need to compile it. We just read the bytecode directly from the cache. So this affects bundling. If you bundle a lot of your JavaScript libraries into one file, and then you want to update one part of it, you lose the code cache for the full bundle. We won't be able to figure out that you have just updated one part of the bundle. So this is just something to be aware of when bundling and updating your code. Um, I already mentioned streaming. That means we start parsing a script while it's downloading, before it has finished downloading the full script. So it makes sense to uh, use this for big scripts. And to use them optimally, you should load them as early as possible on async so that the streamer kicks in. And you can also make sure that the streamer is really streaming your script with Chrome tracing. Here you will see the streamer thread. In the thread, there will be an event parse on background. And in the event, you can see the name of the script that got streamed. Um, there is very little we can do for eval. So there won't be streaming for that. There won't be code cache for that. It makes sense to avoid it, avoid evaling big chunks of code if you can. In some situations, it makes sense to use the parents hack to force eager parsing and eager compilation of the critical path in your code. This makes sense, for example, if you need to support older Chrome versions, if you need performance across browsers, or if you need performance right now and can't wait for us to fix our code. But we are, we're working on sort of making this hack less and less relevant in the future. So there is time for bonus content. So here is bonus content. This is code from the V8 parser. It's a handwritten recursive descent parser written in C++. It's 15,000 lines of code, another 7,000 for the end products, the ASD and scopes. So here we are inside parse if statement. <coughs> Sorry. So the return type of that is statement. And the first thing we expect to see is token if. This is already checked above before calling this function. And then we expect to see a left parent. If there is no left parent, then this is a syntax error, and we bail out of this function. <coughs> So then we recurse. We call a function called parse expression for parsing the condition. This is why the parser is called recursive descent parser. And then we expect the right parent after it. Then we recurse again for parsing the 10 part. And now it's, of course, possible that the 10 part contains another if statement. So we will end up in this function in a recursive manner. Then we check, is there a token else? Mm, if there is, we recurse again for parsing the else part. If there is no else, we do nothing. And then in the end, we construct the AST node for the if statement. So this is roughly how it looks like. It's handwritten, so it's not auto-generated by any rule file or anything like that. So here are some things you might want to remember from the talk. If you have further questions or comments or want to talk about parsing in general, just please get in touch. Thanks for listening.